I don't know if it's still the same, but I remember in elementary school that recess was most important. Because it's when kids decide who is the greatest of all time, or at least greatest for the day. And what they would do is they would single out two people to be captains and to pick their teammates from among the crowd in order to assemble an all-star squad. And everyone in the crowd was hoping that they wouldn't get picked last. And the two captains, they were hoping that they would get to pick first. Because there was always one person in the crowd that was more skilled, more athletic, more strength, more uh, abilities than all the rest. And in a way, if you got to pick them first, you were pretty much guaranteed the win. But let's say now there was a new kid in your school, and this kid you, you didn't really know. You saw them in the crowd. You didn't realize who they were, that in fact the world has never seen a, a greater player of this sport that you're playing than them for that grade. And because you don't know who they are, you, you look at them and you say, they don't look great. Their, their humility, just one among the many, don't make them stand out as being more athletic, being more talented than all the rest. And you just look at them and they just don't look like they've got greatness in them. But if you knew who they were and what they were capable of, you would know that choosing them would guarantee the victory. It would, it would, you would have the greatest of all time on your team. You wouldn't need to pick anyone else. But until you know that, you're going to keep thinking that I have to keep adding more and more people to help me reach the goal. But in fact, if you do have the greatest of all time on your team, then the trophy could already be awarded. You've already won the game by choosing them first. And by choosing them first, all the other picks that you could use would become obsolete. Now, when it comes to Christianity, the Bible tells us that we are up against the wrath of God against our sin for, forever. And the goal of this game, I guess, we don't want to, want to call it a game, but if it were, the goal would be to overcome it or in some way to escape it. And so as the captain of our lives, we choose things and people to help us to be saved from this wrath, to get out of God's punishment against our sin. And so we try all sorts of things. It comes in the form of religious activities or doing as many good deeds as we can, thinking good thoughts or having spiritual knowledge. All sorts of things we think are put onto our team to help us overcome the, 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 the struggle we're against. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the one, the greatest of all time, with which in whom we add to our team and we will have the victory. It describes him as the one who's already secured the victory, the one who's guaranteed that there is no condemnation against us, who has earned and now offers to you eternal life. We read that, and we look at Jesus, and we don't see it. We mistake his humility for weakness. We mistake his servanthood for unimportance. Yet those who do see him clearly who he truly is and what he's capable of, know that they can put all their hope in him. That if they choose him, they know that the, that the victory is guaranteed. They know they have need for nothing else, no one else, in order to please God as his faithful servant and as his beloved child. And we need to understand this as we come to the book of Colossians today. That this morning, as we look at our text, the concern that Paul was, was writing about, trying to correct, was that they were shifting from the hope of the gospel. They were adding more to their faith in Christ by adding empty religion, or, or perhaps they were embracing the, the culture's worldview. Remember, these were not Jewish believers who would have grown up going to the synagogue, learning that there was one God, and it was the God of the Old Testament. No, the, these were Gentiles who grew up in a pagan society with, with so many gods that were everywhere contained in the statues that were found in homes and in marketplaces and in temples. They grew up learning the legends of these supposed deities and could even draw you a picture of what every single one of them looked like. Some of them had a human body. Some of them had an animal's body. Some of them had both. Some of them were like trees, some of them were like stars. It was anything and almost everything in all of creation. And so before the Colossians, 
would have hoped in Christ. They would have understood that there were gods, partial gods, lesser gods, and they were, there were channels to get through to the most high God, to be able to please him, to be able to serve or, or worship him rightly. And so what they would do is they would go through these ladders, these chains, these, these, this, this, this pathway to the right one by worshiping these other ones and by serving them rightly. And only through the right channels could they open the door to the greatest God of all time and to reach his fullness. And as we can tell, as we worked our way through Colossians so far, the Apostle Paul was attempting to expose this as false teaching. This was coming into the church and he was saying that this isn't right and it isn't good. It isn't, you're not supposed to just add Jesus as just one more other God. He's utterly different than all the rest. And Paul wants to point this out. And when we understand who he is and what he is then capable of, we will see that we only need one person on our team to guarantee this victory. He's saying that the other ideas are deceitful. They're only deceptive for you. They are empty. They do not work. Instead, He wants to bring them back to the truth of the gospel. And in order to do this, he wants to show us again that only Christ is the mediator between God and man. That only Christ is the one through whom we can please the most high God. And that only Christ is sufficient to save and to sanctify us completely. The way he's going to do this is by helping us look at Christ and to learn who he truly is that he is, in fact, none other than the God of all gods. He is the God of everything. And by declaring Jesus' full divinity and his supremacy over all things, including all the other spiritual beings in the universe that exist, that they grew up, that the Colossians would have grown up worshiping, if they see who he is, they will have the ultimate reason to abandon everything else that is not according to Christ. So we're going to pick our team to be saved from the wrath of God for our sin. If you pick Christ, you understand who he is and what he can do and what he has done, then victory is guaranteed and you don't need anyone else on your team. So let's look at this description, this magnificent description in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, understanding that this is who Jesus is. Let's read. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So to combat the Colossians' inclination to just lump Jesus in as another angel or another deity of some kind, Paul wants to correct them by revealing who Jesus really is. And particularly here, we see his his full divinity. His starting point is in verse 15, which we read there. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And we have to remember that in that society that's filled with images, uh, statues, and and monuments, and, and, and carvings of other gods, to say that Jesus is the image of the invisible God would have been shocking and probably seen as very foolish among the common beliefs. Paul is saying that he is not like any one of those things, anything created. He is totally other than creation. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's what he is saying here. He's he's not created. He is creator. We'll get to this. But the question that they would have asked then was, okay, so which God is this? What does he look like? That's what they would would have wanted to know because by looking at this God, you can tell if it's powerful, if it's wise, whatever it might be, that you look at it and you would know. And Paul here is telling us that this man... Jesus of Nazareth was more than just like God, more than almost God, more than another God. He is 
the God of all gods. Paul doesn't leave any room for conclusions that are less than that. The only conclusion that we can come to with what these verses tell us is that he is the God of everything. And the fact that God is invisible signifies to us that he's not physical. He's not something that we can see as a, as a shape or having a body of some kind. He is spirit, Jesus said in John uh, chapter 8. And it goes one step further, meaning that he is not part of creation. The invisible God is the God that we meet at the very beginning of all things, the beginning of time, where Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God was there. He created everything. This is the God who is not just before all creation. He is beyond all creation. He is not created. He is creator. He's unlike anything in all of creation. And therefore, he is not made of created things. He is wholly other than it. And the invisible God is eternally supreme over all creation, including every other uh, God that this world can manufacture and every other spiritual being that was created. This is whom Paul here is equating Jesus with. And we need to see the implications of that. Verse 16 emphasizes this further. He's trying, to see, he's trying to say that Jesus is fully divine. He is the most high God. And he adds to it this. Jesus, in him, he created all things. So, so this is the God who created all things. That's Jesus. In heaven and on earth, all things, visible and invisible, all things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So more than just being its creator, verses 16 and 17 go even further to say that it's, he is its sustainer and indeed its very purpose. It says, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When you think of the man, Jesus, the one you say, you claim, you believe in for salvation, do you see him as the invisible God. This is who Paul says he is. This is who he wants us. And the Bible agrees with this all throughout, that Jesus is the God of all gods. And when we look at him, is that who you see? And if he is this, then there is not one other being, anything created that rivals or equals God in any way. Because anything you think might owes its existence to him. So this is the invisible God whom Paul is referring to here, the eternally supreme God of all gods who has no shape or form to be accurately portrayed in an image or a statue or a carving or something like that. And he cannot be contained by a home or a, a, a temple or anything like that either. The invisible God, th this truth is applied in the second commandment of the ten. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Nothing of all creation should be, should be similar or carved and then worshipped as if it was God. It says there, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous because none of these things that he has made comes close to accurately representing him. And so there is nothing to compare him to. And yes, we know that God uses the creation in, in a variety of ways as metaphors to help us understand who he is, but in no way can it accurately reflect him rightly, perfectly. They remain imperfect tools for the incomprehensible job of describing, of showing us who God is. Set apart from everything else, only God can be God. Only He can be Him. And so after introducing this invisible God, Paul now is, is showing this unpopular truth at a time in those days. He's, he's, he set this up. There is one ultimately supreme God who is above and before and beyond everything and he's invisible, the question then is, if we can't see him, how can we know him? 
What are, we, what are we supposed to imagine? How can we know a God that we cannot see? And the wonderful thing about this God is that he wants to be known. And so he reveals himself by speaking and by acting. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. It says, in the things that have been made. So his handiwork in creation constantly declares his glory. But he is so much more than just powerful and divine. So much more. So he initiates and condescends to our level to speak to us directly and even through us to inform us more about who he is and even tells us what he is up to in this world. And so we read through the Old Testament, we see things like to Adam and Eve, we see his love. To to Noah, we see his hatred for sin. To Abraham, we see his plans, what he is doing in this world, what he is is trying to accomplish. To, uh, to, To Joseph, he shows his goodness even through evil. To Moses, he shows his power. To Israel, he shows his faithfulness, his holiness, and we begin to see more and more of who this invisible God really is. And even through his people, by them writing his words down with the oversight of God and the composition of the Bible, we see that he has unchanging truth. He is truth. And so although he is unseen, people have known him. We can know him by how he speaks and acts within history. But then there came a day where something completely new happened. It was by far greater and clearer than any other revelation of the invisible God from before it. We we know that the fully divine became fully human. The the uncreated one became a creation. In In John's gospel, it begins talking about the same God here who was in the beginning and who created all things. He calls him the Word. And then it says, a few verses later, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the eternal God was conceived in the womb of a woman, carried for nine months, and delivered like all other human babies were. This was God. The ageless and the all-powerful and all-wise God was now a child who needed to grow in strength and wisdom, and even years. The infinite God was pleased to dwell fully within the confines of a mortal body. This is miraculous. This is astounding. We can't fully understand this, and yet this is what happens. This nobody from Nazareth named Jesus, Paul declares here, is the almighty, invisible God who had come to reveal himself and to accomplish his purposes. So by seeing him, by looking at him, we see who the invisible God is and what he is like and what he is doing. So much that Jesus says in his life, we we see this multiple times, his claims to divinity. He says that they are one, him and the invisible God. He says, whoever has seen me, you've seen him, you've seen the Father. It's, it's, It's the same, equal. You see me, you see the Father. That's what Jesus said. He also said, you neither know me nor my Father, because if you knew me, you would know my Father also. You know one, you know the other. He also said, whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. So so Jesus comes, and he reveals to us this invisible God, because that is who he is. We cannot escape the fact that, that, the, that the visible Jesus claimed to be none other than the invisible God. The same writer of Colossians wrote in Philippians, he says that Jesus was in the form of God before he took the form of man. And this is what Hebrews 1 means when it says that he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So if anyone wanted to see the invisible God, all they had to do was look at Christ in the flesh. 
And everything he said, everything he did, tells us exactly what the invisible God in heaven is like. I read something this week that I, I didn't write it down, but it was very memorable. It said this, there is no God in heaven that is unlike Jesus. Jesus shows us. Jesus is the God in heaven. And that's what Paul wants us to see here. Verse 15 calls him the image, the clearest expression, image of the invisible God. And of course, there are people, there are religions that will take this phrase to mean that Jesus is an image, like a statue is of the real person, or that a picture is of the real thing. But, but image can be used in a, in a variety of meanings. It has a range of meanings from saying something is similar or something is exactly the same. Both can be images. And what we need to see here is that if, if Paul is saying that Jesus is the one through whom and by whom and for whom all things were created, and if Jesus is the one that who is before all things and in him all things hold together, do we imagine that Paul means to say that he is, some, he is sort of like God or that he is the invisible God? Only a couple of verses later in verse 19, Paul will say, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And he'll repeat it in chapter 2, where he says, In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. There is a point, a very clear point, that Paul is trying to make in Colossians here. He's trying to convince these believers not to add anything because there is no need to add anything to be saved, to be sanctified completely. Christ is all that you need because he is fully divine. He's not in the hierarchy somewhere. He is the ultimate, the God of all gods. And, and when we come to a verse like this and people might try to, to make it say something it's not, we have to see it in the context. And we ought never to be content to interpret a verse that completely contradicts another one. We always take what is clearer or clearest to interpret what might be unclear. And in, in light of everything that Paul has said, he is saying that this image is, he's not an image of God, he is the image of God. The context helps us not to stumble over another phrase in verse 15, which says that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. How can he be the firstborn out of all the created things if he himself is uncreated? And again, firstborn is used as the one born first, as, as if he was part of creation, but it's also used in the way of the position. The king of Israel was called the firstborn, not because he was born first, but because of his position before or in front of all of the other people. He was considered the firstborn. He had importance over the others. He had authority. And so Jesus here over creation is not only having priority because he existed before it, he also has preeminence because he has authority over it. He is greater than all of creation. And I don't think Paul allows us to miss this point if we read this all together. So the, the, it's obvious here, and it's very similar to what John 1 verse 18 says. It says that no, no one has ever seen God. But then it adds this. It says, the only God who is at the Father's side, that is the Son, that is Jesus, he has made him known. And the question is, what did he, how did he make him known? What did he reveal? What did we see when we saw him? And it is that he made visible the invisible God. It says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son, full of grace and truth. And so everything Jesus said, everything Jesus was, everything Jesus did tells us what the God, the invisible God of heaven is like. He is God. And we need to see him as such, even though we often imagine him having a body, because he did. And we look at him, and, and many people miss him because they see just the man. But Paul here is reminding us that he is God. And it changes the way we trust him, the way we hope in him for salvation from the wrath of God when we understand that he has the power, he is capable and has already accomplished everything we need to be saved. 
So for the Colossians and for us as the church today, when we weaken in our faith in Christ and we start adding other things because we think that that will assure us that we will be saved or at least it'll help, we have lost sight of who Jesus really is. Only when we understand Jesus rightly, truly, biblically, only then will we understand that he is God who came into the world as a man to save us from our sins and how he did it was exactly how it needed to happen. It was the only way. He needed to be truly both God and man. So if Jesus, your Jesus, the one you are trusting in, if he's both invisible God and visible man at the same time, if he's both dwelling fully within a body while at the same time sustaining the entire universe, if he's both conceived by God and born as a baby boy, if he's both supremely beautiful in all of the universe and yet having a, a, a face like all other humans do, if he's both sinless while bearing the sins of the whole world, if he's both the one receiving God's wrath and the one pouring it out, if he's both one who dies and then the one who raises himself from the dead, if he's both the one ruling at the right hand of God while becoming your servant to serve you in your life, if this is your Jesus, if he's both doing all of these things, then he is the only one that we should be eternally anchored in forever. There is nothing greater there is nothing better, there is nothing stronger that we can trust in than, his, than him and his saving work for us. So when we know Christ as he truly is, only then will nothing steal your joy. Nothing can unhitch your hope. Nothing can rattle your faith because it's in the greatest of all time and beyond time. First Timothy proclaims to us, it says, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, today, what we need and what we always need is to be reminded of the truth of who your Son is. That he is fully God, and that all the work that he has done could only have been completed by him perfectly. There are others who have tried to save themselves. There are other things out there that might make us feel like they can work. But when we truly realize our predicament, that your wrath is coming upon us because of our sins, and we realize that there is nothing that we can do, nothing that others can do for us, and nothing in all of creation that can rescue us from you except you, in your grace, and by your mercy, and because of your great love, only then by you doing what we need so desperately to, to come humbly as a human, to live the perfect life that we lack, to die a, a, a death that forgives every one of our sins, paying every single one of them off, to rise again so that we can have righteousness, that we can be forgiven, and that we can have eternal life with you, all in Christ. And so I pray today that if there is no immediate application, it seems like, there is one that we need to do, and that is to look at Christ. And would you open our eyes to see the truth of who he is, that he is you, that you came to us. Thank you, Father, for it is by grace alone that that took place, your grace. We do not deserve it, and yet now we can have a right to an eternal inheritance because of everything that you've done, because of our hope that is in you. I pray that we would see him as, as the greatest God of all, and that when we think of our Savior, we worship him, the only one who deserves our worship. Help us, Father, not to forget these things, but to, to anchor ourselves in them. That you are God, and there is no other. And we pray that you, as the head of, our, of this church, of the church, 
and, and all that you are doing in this world, that we would trust you and love you more. Help us to see you as clearly as we can. Would you open the eyes of our hearts? Thank you for your grace and your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.